The track wastes no time with its introduction. With a flurry of instruments coming at the listener left and right, the song strongly beckons for the player to engage with the game promptly. The song implements a stop and go effect with its instrumentation, reflecting what is likely happening on screen. Sonic 2 is a very much stop and go game after all. Obstacles and enemies may be impeding your path, requiring quick reflexes to avoid them by the player. In that sense, this music perfectly fits that tone. To contrast this high energetic pace, an easy to follow melody plays atop everything else. The synthesized melody itself hints at something melancholic, yet inspiring hope at the same time. Considering the level this music plays in is itself a ruin from a bygone civilization, the melody fits well. All in all, the composer for Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Masato Nakamura, truly nailed the tense, frenetic pace the game plays at. Despite being a somewhat early title for the Sega Genesis, Aquatic Ruin Zone really stretched the limits of what the console was capable of. It was clear that Nakamura was given almost complete freedom to do what he wanted with the music. At the time, Nakamura was also the bassist and lead songwriter of a band Dreams Come True. His bass and percussion influence can clearly be heard in this song. As like in Sonic 1, the composer was given only still images and concept art to work with. Upon seeing these images, Nakamura treated the soundtrack like a movie, which explains how melodically structured his songs are. For the song itself, Aquatic Ruin Zone immediately jumps in for the first section with almost no buildup. This is a usual approach that the Sonic franchise is known for. When dissecting Sonic music, there are usually three main elements. The melody, the rhythmic elements, and the counter melodies. Melody is given the first priority, thus it can be heard over all other aspects of the song. The rhythm is tremendously complex. The bass, the drums for instance, aren't just playing the standard four pattern beat, as we'll see later. Surprisingly, the song still manages to retain a 4-4 time signature throughout. Another rhythmic element is the bass and the lead part, whose plucky sound contributes to the energetic pace. So we will play this intro and you can see all those three elements. So this lead is the melody, this is the counter melody, and the rhythm parts. The drums, bass, and this bass and lead part. So as you just heard, the whistle acts as the counter melody in both sections A and B. But when we get to section C, the synth brass takes that role prominently. Not only are these two harmonizing with each other, the synth brass is also harmonizing with itself. This is a lot to take in, so let's break it down step by step and we'll see how this song is constructed. In the song, and especially in this first section, the bass lays the foundation for the rest of the instruments, using this space D note. You might be forgiven if you thought the bass was simple in this section. But that's about to change in section B. Here we have a two note motif that continually descends, starting from this G right here. These notes highlight the offbeats of the measure, and they quickly fill in at the end of the measure, which alters the pacing right here. In the second go around, the pattern still stays, stays the same, but it rises here, which leads, leads us into the transition. Like in the previous fill, this transition breaks up the pacing in an unusual way that only can be really felt when played with the rest of the instruments.
Section C switches from a two note pattern to a three note one. And if you notice, the first note of this pattern always is short compared to the rest of them. And as with the previous pattern, the melody line starts to descend at first, but it quickly shoots up to this high E and uses another pace altering fill at the end of this measure. The second time around switches some things around as it descends to this low E instead of rising higher here. And it ends with these two sets of three staccato notes here. The drums themselves uses only several key sounds, the kick being the most prominent, followed by the snare, then the hi-hats, then the clap, and finally the toms. So when you slow it down, you can see that this is the kick, this is the hi-hat, and this is the clap, and then this E is the snare. With this relatively sparse arrangement, Nakamura manages to compose a multi-faceted rhythm section. In section A, the kick plays on all the beats, while adding an additional kick at the end of each. The clap, which is not widely used in video game music, is featured briefly in the opening. These two. Hi-hats can also be hard to comprehend in this song, as they both follow the kick and contrast it in alternating measures. The snare punctuates the final beat of the second measure. And lastly, on the second time around, the toms enter. A descend downward. Overall, this drum pattern is very unique in its setup. Moving on to the next section, things get even more layered. The kick pattern adds additional kicks. Two toms are added along with the clap. This transition uses a mostly snare fill, but also includes that hi-hat, which kind of both compares and contrasts. The second transition uses the claps instead of the snares, and an interesting pattern here. Section C, when heard by itself, can be a little repetitive, but when played with all the instruments, it gives the song a very offbeat rhythm. So here's with the rest of the instruments. So dissecting this beat a little further, you can see that these two toms here start off the beat. The snare and the kick are pretty standard here. And in the transition, it features another syncopated pattern. This plays well nicely with the bass. The final transition follows the rest of the instruments. Used only in this first section, the synth leads melody is a simple chromatic rise up to the A, which is the fifth of the home note, D. The final two notes are C sharp, which are the leading tone of D. So Nakamura adds a little spice in the second variance here. The melody is also doubled by the second synth lead. The sound for this synth lead is quite unique. I purposely wanted this instrument to hit around the 500 to 4K frequency range. So around this area. 
I do this in contrast to the other synth lead. The first section, of course, doubles the first synth, while in section B is where this instrument takes the reins and produces one of the most memorable melodies of the entire soundtrack. The interesting thing about this melody is that it's the one instrument that determines the chord progression. The bass, which is the usual instrument for this task, arrives only after the melody shifts chords. The listeners almost rely on the synth lead to know when the chord progression is moving, as you'll see when I play here. The melody also uses the clever technique of taking a short break in each measure. So you can see these breaks here. This allows the music to take a breather just for a moment. Another note is that the notes themselves vary in length to keep the listener off guard. Like in many themes, this motif here repeats again, but with a variance at the end. It reaches for the slow C sharp note instead of the G note. Section C here includes a more rhythmic pattern that repeats and descends down after every measure, but it crawls back up at the end and repeats this whole pattern again. Also notice how this note here remains the same while the other instruments play on this fill. The last few notes also join with the rest of the instrument. Moving on to this new instrument, you might be wondering why we call this the basin lead. We name it such due to the quick and light sound a lead synth might have, but also combines a softer bass tone underneath. Unfortunately, as you can see, I rolled off much of the low end here, so it allows more room for the bass. And I also rolled off some of the high end. The first section reminds me a lot of a Latin dance beat, and how it continually jumps back on these D and F note. Visually, you can see how the D note is kind of like the average or median of this pattern. Putting this sort of motif in the song creates a very interesting and slightly off-putting mood, but I think it works. You can see that when I add more instruments, the song starts to flesh out more. When I remove it, you don't have that ear intriguing sound. Plus, it would leave this space where the melody drops off completely open. Section B is when things get a little crazy. You can see that this pattern rises up with the melody. Now the composer is careful to place which notes have a shorter length compared to the others, such as these notes at the end. You should always have something ear intriguing going on at every moment in an up-tempo song like this one. The barely audible square wave makes an appearance in the Aquatic Ruin Zone. Its sole purpose is to give extra harmony to the basin lead. It's mostly played down a fourth from the basin lead too. Also note that the notes themselves are almost staccato-like. Short but not quite staccato. The same type of mirroring is displayed in the following section. It's only in section C when the square wave itself is featured.
It harmonizes with itself by mostly fourths and follows the descending chord progression of the song. The main role it plays here is to supply the drum with additional groove. The whistle in this song is what I like to call the ear intrigue instrument. It is used sparsely throughout the music, but its parts are yet memorable. As you'll see, the whistle only plays when there is a break in the music and the melody ends. In section A, this alternate DA-DA pattern is repeated twice as the melody reaches its last note. Same thing happens in section B, as almost continuing the melody forward. The next motif here is a nice chromatic descent down, which leads us nicely back into the repeat of this verse. Lastly, the transition right here has a nice slide down at the end. And this leads us into section C. Only appearing in section C, the synth brass acts as almost a double lead with the synth lead here. The first measure harmonizes with it note for note. Until you get to the second measure where it, where it hangs on this chord here. And this cool transition chromatically upward follows the bass. I believe the main purpose Nakamura added this instrument was to fill out both the high end of the frequency range and also to provide some stereo to the mix. Now for effects, the percussion is given a little bit of a distortion lift by softly saturating it using this plugin from FL Studio. You can see how adding it provides a needed bite to the sound. The second synth brass here is given a delay effect, making it bounce a second time after it's played. Traditionally, composers of this era would double this instrument and slightly offset the second of the two. However, the same effect can be applied easily through a delay plugin. Since music composers at the time were new to the idea of panning, it wasn't used as often as it could have been. Many instruments were panned up the center, including the bass, here, the drums, the synth lead, the square wave, the synth brasses, and the last piercing synth. It should also be noted that the delay for the synth brass here is panned in stereo, meaning that while the bass sound is in center, the reverb actually bounces around the left and right speaker. Since the song itself is a very dry sounding mix, this reverb gives the song a sonic lift. Moving to section C, panning is wisely used as the mix would sound far too cluttered if everything was panned in mono. The square wave, the bass, the drums, and the synth brass are panned center. So I'll play this section here, and you can see. You have these, this synth brass here, this synth lead, they both go right. And then the second synth lead, opposite. In this counter melody between these two, the lower of the two is pan left, and the higher of the two is pan right. This is used in great effect to create a diverse and ear-pleasing mix. Without proper volume placement, the song would sound very confusing. Here is a version of the song where everything is in the same volume placement.
As usual, the melody instruments are placed in the foreground, with the drums and bass close behind. The whistle followed by those two. The counter melody that the bass and lead plays is given some room as well. Now as usual, I'll play the entire song in full and I'll highlight specific sections so you can see what's going on. Aquatic Ruin Zone is one of the more energetic pieces in the Sonic 2 soundtrack. However, in comparison with other upbeat tempo songs at the time, Masato Nakamura does not rely on the bass and drums to mainly keep the rhythm. The combination of other aspects, such as the square wave, bass and lead, and the tempo itself contributes to the pacing. The composer is also a master at giving the listener a flurry of sound almost to the breaking point, but ever so slightly pulls it back so the listener can enjoy the song. Despite being only 36 seconds in length, Aquatic Ruin Zone will always stand out as one of the highlights in Nakamura's career. As ever, thank you for watching. I'm curious to know your thoughts on the song. I've taken the time to upload these files so you can personally see how this song is constructed. Well, check the description and post below with your findings. Let me know what other video game songs you would like to see and I'll see you in the next analysis.